Hello, lords and ladies of the internet. I'm the King of Candor, and today I'm going to be talking about King Kong and his role in an official D&D module. So the module I'm talking about is the Isle of the Ape. The Isle of the Ape module was written by Gary Gygax in 1985. This module is also known as WG6. This means the module takes place in the world of Greyhawk and is part of the foundational canon for that setting. I was first introduced to this module by being told it was the first official D&D module to include King Kong. That's technically not true, as King Kong by name does not appear. However, the module is basically a King Kong cash grab, and I actually ran this module a few months ago with some of my players. I'll go over their thoughts at the end of my review. From here on out, there's going to be spoilers. So if you want your game master to run you through this, send him or her here, and then come back for the return of the video. Be sure to like and subscribe before you leave. Now, on to the module review. Before we get started, I'm going to have to tell you, I did change some of this module in order to run it for my players. This module is very firmly set in the Greyhawk setting, and has, let's just say, special rules that make it unique there. The map in the module is also very difficult to read, and since I'm working with a PDF scan, it's almost unusable. But, I found a fantastic modern update done by Rayshear1966 on Reddit, and I've linked that below if you'd like to use it. I highly recommend doing so, it's a great map. The module opens informing you of a couple special rules that only exist here. It starts by saying no god can understand or see this plane of existence, so any divine spells probably won't work. However, you can still cast healing as a cleric, I think it just means like divinations. All psionic powers do not work. Psionics were a special thing in first edition where you could basically be an X-Man on top of your class. Invisibility spells and illusions also do not work. You cannot have divine intervention, and it is noted that the only person who can see the Isle of the Ape is Zagiek, and, quote, he only wants to watch to see if you can survive or become fertilizer, end quote. Those are the module's words, not mine. Also, if you try to levitate, apparently snakes fly out of nowhere and attack you. If you thought your stuff was safe, you're wrong. There's a 100% chance that all your food, drink, and paper will rot after one day. Also, there is a 25% chance that you will be attacked by some fungal or bacterial infection that will try to kill you. If you would attempt to fly, birds and pterodactyls will come down and try to kill you. As the module says, quote, In short, there's no safe place on the Isle of the Ape. End quote. And just to make sure you can't have any fun, it also wants you to know that apes do not count as humanoids. Therefore, rangers cannot use their abilities on them. The first actual part of the module is cool because you're summoned to meet with the great wizard Tensor. Yeah, that's the guy who made that floating disc. He basically tells you that there's this super important rod that you must get for him, and it will end the world if it's not brought back. However, he's far too busy to go get it himself. Also, there's an evil demigod who's after it, and if she gets it, the world will double in, so no pressure. To help you get there, he's going to give you a magical boat that will allow you to sail into the dimension containing the Isle of the Ape. He says that the Crook of Rao, which is the object you're supposed to gather, was lost by him and his adventuring allies when they were on the island many years ago and they teleported away for safety. Teleporting away causes all your items to immediately fall to the ground and make you naked so it's not a good idea to do that. He also lists an absolute ton of other items that he lost and tells the players they're allowed to keep any of these things if they can get to the objects. Now, because this is such an important matter, Tensor will not tell the players any of the restrictions I talked about earlier. If you ask him, he'll explain them to you, but if you don't ask him, he will just neglect to mention all of this and it is noted that it's the player's fault for not asking. Also, when you're given the boat, the players are taught three magical words. Chali, which causes the boat to become a boat, and it can sail in the inlets. Dragon ship, 
That turns it into a full ship required for the long distance journeys and batten, which causes it to turn into a small box for transportation. The module says that you must memorize these, and if a player is caught writing them down, they must be changed randomly. If you think this is mean, just wait, the module gets a lot worse. Just to help you get in the mindset, the module says since the players are a high level, if they refuse this request, they are to be insulted, coerced, flattered, or humiliated until they accept the quest, including saying that they're not properly role-playing their characters. So now the players have set sail, willingly or not, if they choose to not go to the main island, apparently they are allowed to conquer and enslave other islands, but it's noted this will not allow them to go home. I really wonder how many people in playtesting did that, for them to have to include that blurb here. Also, the island they're on is going to be noted as being the most savage and most brutal, with a lot of extremely large gorillas on the island. These gorillas have been tamed by the natives and are used by them in warfare. After the players land, if they do not take the boat with them, the module says in 2d4 hours, the boat will simply sail away as the tide comes in. While the players are slowly exploring towards what they think is civilization, a large number of enemy warriors will lie in ambush. How large? About 60 cannibals, including gorillas and shamans and the war chief. So good luck guys. After the players kill the chieftain and they loot all the bodies, the witch doctor will escape by turning invisible and levitating away. No, I am not sure why he's allowed to do that and none of the players can. The rest of the warriors will go back to their base and will prepare for the player's arrival. As they begin exploring the areas towards the village, it is a bunch of normal descriptions. However, in a section called a meadow-like area, there are a bunch of lizards who are grazing. These are vegetarian reptiles. However, the moment they see the players, or the players enter their dens, they will charge the party, attempting to consume them because they love flesh so much. From here, if the players enter the compound, there will be 8 groups of 8 giant boars on patrol. That's 64 boars in total, who will all attack the players on sight. The moment one group spots them, they will immediately howl, and all the other groups will just know where the players are, and thus will start charging at once. Also, the boars use scent, so you just can't hide from them. Everything else in the village is pretty much useless, and it is noted that the warriors wear their wealth, meaning they were already looted, right? However, the village chieftain has a dwelling. If you go inside, his giant ape that is level 12 will spring out of nowhere and get a plus 2 on all attacks against them due to surprise. The ape is totally silent and cannot be detected. I'm not sure why the ape is totally silent, but apparently it is. Entering the shaman or the witch doctor's tents, you'll find that he has some stuffed reptiles. Touching one of them will cause all four of them to turn into giant spinning snakes that will immediately attack the players. So much fun. If at any point he is cornered, I think the witch doctor will surrender. I'm not sure how this guy is supposed to be alive, but he needs to be for later on. Also, if the players wait around too long, another group of natives will sail back and attack them. After leaving the village, they will come to a sacrificial altar thing that may or may not have a woman currently tied to it. The module says the natives love doing this and sacrificing them to the big monkey, but usually another random animal comes by and just eats her. <laughs> there are some cool rooms to explore here, that can help explain why there's this random concrete module, but that won't become important until later. I'll call back to it. I probably should tell you the name of the giant monkey. If you're making King Kong rip off, you probably should come up with some cool names. Donkey Kong is a classic one, Kunga, George, Peking Man, and many others have all been used throughout the years. Our King Kong rip off is called Unga. That's right, Unga. I absolutely hate this name for reasons I'll go into at the end, and I renamed him to Kolar Kong. You'll see why. So, as the players begin exploring this ruined ritual site, 
and if they've interrogated him or read the big witch doctor's books, they will find out that there's a ritual you must do to summon Unga. But the original high priest didn't trust his three sons, so he only taught each of them one part of the ritual. Then when he died, his three sons had a civil war and split the island into the three current tribes, with them teaching each one of their successor witch doctors part of the ritual. So in order to successfully summon Unga, the players must gather all three witch doctors and they will read their part of the ritual. From here, the players basically get free reign of the island. What's a little upsetting is, they can find a map earlier or at any time the game master thinks is appropriate, but the map is basically useless. It shows the physical landscape, but it doesn't have any noted points of interest, except it tells you where to meet the big ape, and where the village of guys that you just killed live. With no obvious points of interest, the players will have to wander the island searching for the other shamans. And basically everything on the island wants to murder the players. One of the encounters is they're walking and they could spot several stegosauri, that's the correct borrow, and if they notice the players, they immediately charge to kill them. Alright. When the players are in a big open field with no cover, unless they're specifically looking behind them, a Tyrannosaurus Rex will charge them and get to them before they react. There's this part here where they can cross a narrow river, and as they're crossing the boat that the, they have to make themselves, two Mosasauruses will come out of nowhere and attack them. Everything is angry all the time and it hates you. Now, continuing the adventure, in order to find the ritual parts, you have to first go to this high plateau region here. There's a bunch of cavemen, and their shaman knows the ritual, but he's afraid that his tribe will kill him for not being youthful. So, he's also incredibly forgetful, which is great. The module says, at any moment, there's a 50-50 shot, he will forget everything, which is funny, but it sounds very annoying to deal with. He will willingly join the party, but if he gets too stressed, or is magically coerced, he will forget the ritual until he calms down. To find the final tribe, you need to go to the very high plateau region here. It is completely different from the high plateau region, as it is very high. This is inhabited by bird people. No, these are not Tengu. These are just cavemen who have hunting birds instead of hunting dogs. So they're called the bird people. Their shaman will willingly join the players if they can find and kill an extremely powerful female ape who is wandering the island, or if they show themselves to be of sufficient skill. This shaman is also insane and will always attempt to jump off of high platforms because he thinks he can turn into a bird unless he's restrained. Remember, if you fail to get any of these three shaman, you cannot complete the ritual and you fail the module. Something really cool here though is if you wipe out the cannibals from the beginning of the adventure, the bird people will eventually move down there to where the cannibals lived and take over, becoming the new warriors of the island. They will integrate the cavemen from the high plateau area and make a less violent society in 20 years. So now that you have all three shamans and you're going to perform the ritual, which will teleport you outside Unga's lair, the party will enter and begin exploring through a series of caves and tunnels. Unga can spawn in any of these and will attack the players if so. It will usually attack for a round or two and then flee. And if he's not in these caves, a different monster will be there and attack them. Personally, I don't think him spawning all over the place is interesting, so I just used the default monsters and had the big epic fight with him in the big epic fight room. There is just one thing to note. There is a room that the sign basically says do not enter, however the players have to translate that, and if they enter it their characters are essentially dead. They are teleported to a realm with no oxygen, and if they somehow survive not having oxygen, they must drift in the astral sea until something bumps into them, which takes from a minimum of one year to a hundred. So, now they have their big fight with Unga, and it's just kind of boring. He's a big monkey. Other than having magic resistance, he doesn't have any special abilities. And if you remember earlier, all the tribes have tamed giant monkeys anyway. After you kill him, they should head back to the room that will automatically kill them that I mentioned a second ago, and ask about the Crook of Rao. You can simply mention his name for what I've gathered, and that successfully completes the adventure. 
All the items they asked for are dumped in front of them, and all the items mentioned at the beginning of the adventure, as well as a bunch of other things are here. However, as the players go to leave, they notice there's a mist blocking their exit. It turns out they've been brought to another totally separate plane of existence, and they have been given a passageway to follow. There's a long mix of colored hallways, and the players have to follow only the colors on the rainbow. So while starting in the red hallway, the players ha will have a pink hallway and an orange hallway, and they must take the orange hallway and so forth until they find an exit. If they go to any of the other exits, they are given no hint. If they leave through the rainbow route, they are given an incredibly vague hint that they should take their aims highest. Afterwards, they are teleported to another room where they see huge jewels floating in the sky, seven of them to be exact. The one that's the highest is the Amethyst, and they are told that they have to pick one, that is their fate, and the other six are the reward. Each gem is worth an incredible 50,000 gold, so grabbing all of them is pretty worth it. If they start with the Amethyst gem, then they get to go home, adventure over, Tensor thanks them for being heroes. If they then refuse to give the rod to Tensor, he just summons a bunch of angels and they gank the players. However, if they grab a different gem, they are transported to a completely white chamber with heroic looking warriors and pearl armor and golden trim all around, where a guy named Eric greets them and offers to take the objects off their hands, saying that they've done a good job. You remember all the way back at the beginning when I said Tenzer told the party there was an evil demigod after the artifact? Well, these are her minions disguised as holy paladins of good. If the players willingly hand over the object, or they find that these guys are evil and willing to sell the object to them, they're allowed to leave and then sent through the outer hells where they suffer for all eternity until they find their way back. If they refuse to sell the object or figure out the problem and attempt to flee, the demons will turn and attack them. They're pretty tough, but the demons can be instantly defeated by invoking the Crook of Rao or by calling out for help to the actual angels who are watching this whole time. Now, assuming your players are somehow not dead, that is the end of the adventure, and they're brought back to Tensor, just like before. There are a lot of locations on this map. I'm not going to cover all the areas of the map, as many of them are super boring or covered in the normal module, but I'll hit a few highlights here. In the center of the island, there's a lake, and in the lake, there's an island, that has a magical building that allows the players to rest. There are nine doors, one for each alignment, and you have to figure out what door it is based on the symbols. You cannot give them any hints, and if they've not figured out the doors after nine attempts, they lock. If somebody in the wrong alignment enters the room, it disables that room. If you get everybody to enter the correct rooms, then the rooms will become fairly furnished and allow full resting and healing. That's pretty good. This next area is called the Dormant King, which is a fantastic name for a ruin. It's this structure that's just kind of in the middle of the island, and if you go mess with it, you will find out that there is an aura emanating around 600 feet that keeps all low intelligence creatures away. However, once you get there, you will see this giant pool next to it that's emanating magical energies. A Tyrannosaurus Rex will jump out of this pool and attack the party immediately. <laughs> he regains health equal to the max HP of whatever he just killed, so that means every time he kills a player, he basically full heals. And if he's killed, he will simply disappear back in the pool. If players run away outside of the 600 foot radius, he will simply teleport himself back to the pool. Regardless of how he was killed, he will regenerate the next day at full health Rearing for a fight. So, do you remember the random concrete module I mentioned earlier with the ruins? As well as that the players met with it, they'll find out that there's this magical purple metal helping power it. The pool next to the ruins is made of the same concrete and purple metal, linking them together magically. This shows that the demigod Zagag built both of them. Curiously, when looking in the pool, regardless of what the current sky is, it looks like a distinct night sky with stars. After three turns, bubbles will fly out of the pool, engulf the players and drag them into it. If you pop one of these bubbles, they deal 2d20 damage in a large radius, 
which is absolutely nutty. If you're dragged into the portal, you enter the Spheres of Thought, a demiplane of Zigyag. While here, you move through mental focus and orbs of insanity attack you. Getting hit once gives you this chart, which lasts for 1d12 hours. I find the one where you are in love very funny, of course. Every time you're hit, your intelligence also goes down by 1. If your intelligence is 0, then you get to roll on this chart, and you have a permanent mind-affecting effect upon you. I suppose this is what happened to that shaman guy from earlier. There is a third group of spheres that's on this chart, which are kind of errant thoughts from Zigyag. If the players caused too much damage, and they attack the spheres, or they attempt to cast any spells to alter the plane of existence, they are immediately expelled from the room of the pool and locked inside a frowning prison, being stuck there, unable to move until all the other characters can open the prison. They have to go through these bubbles and start working through them to get a hint to get out. The hint requires you to go through all 10 spheres of thought. If all the party gets stuck in there, they're enslaved for 1d10 years, at which point they're teleported back home and fail the adventure. So that's all the locations on the map. Now, before we continue, if you like the content, don't forget to like and subscribe. So what did me and my players think of this adventure? Honestly, they kind of hated it. I ended up having to do a lot of homebrewing to make this just not suck. What really bothers me is the island is so bland and flavorless. There are two parts that really stick out as interesting to me. The color puzzle at the very, very end and that dimensional pool. So, I went back and rewrote the adventure with the color puzzle in mind. I was inspired by the rainbow monkeys from Codename Kids Next Door. So, I gave all the giant apes different colors, and each color gave that monkey a special power. The red ones had fire resistance and could attack twice in a round. The blue ones had cold resistance and had a much increased armor class. I renamed Oonga to Kolar Kong. Kolar Kong has the ability to shift his form into any one of the colors on his turn. This gives him the benefit of all the colors of the rainbow when he needs to. Also, if he took 10% of his health in damage from an elemental type, he automatically switches to that. This prevents players from bursting him down with high damage, but it also allowed them a way to force him out of some of the colors. Pink, for example, allows him to heal rapidly, and then yellow allows him to teleport, so keeping him away from these colors became a priority. I also gave all the dinosaurs a couple of colors too, again, to help solidify this entire color theme. I kept the physical map the same. However, instead of setting it in another dimension, I said that this was an island in uncharted territory. The players only discovered it because they were attacked by a group of pirates who had a vendetta against them. They were outnumbered and sailed into some strange mists to try to lose the pirates. They didn't see the rocks and sandbars, meaning the players nearly wrecked their ship, causing massive damage and barely allowing it to dock at the island. You see, they were cheap beforehand and their crew was few in number, so they were going to take a long time to repair the boat. The players decided, let's explore the island. While exploring, they were ambushed by the cannibals at the beginning, and for the most part I kept it the same, but reduced the amount of cannibals. I also read the ritual. Instead of being a phrase that they have to learn from the different shamans, it is four pieces of an artifact. I also added another tribe to the map. They got the first piece of the necklace from finding the cannibals at the beginning, just like the normal adventure. However, the second piece of the necklace was taken from the cavemen to the south. The shaman here was in conflict with the chieftain, trying to take over the tribe. The players basically had to engage with a power struggle here, either siding with the chieftain and helping him find evidence to have the shaman removed, or helping the shaman secretly assassinate the chieftain. Either way, they were given the necklace as a reward. The third piece that they got was from the bird people tribe, and I did end up making them actually bird people. In my setting, the bird race is called the Chojin, and they have their own unique lore. I don't want to bore you with the details, 
but the players discovered they were from a shipwrecked crew of an exploration vessel hundreds of years ago, and they slowly integrated with the tribe here. These people simply wanted to return to the promised land of their ancestors, and the players could either teach some shipbuilding technology if they had some, or teleport them back if they had teleportation magic. There was about 300 members of this tribe, so teleporting them would take a few days. Another option they could have done was give them the boat they arrived on. My players ended up doing a bit of the third option, but really a fourth option, which was hiring all of them to be the crew for the boat, and simply ask them to wait until they finished killing Kolar Kong, and then the players with the chosen people would sail back to civilization. After agreeing to this, they went to go help with boat repairs. Before I get to the fourth amulet, I'm going to cover a couple of the side quests that were on the island. There was another tribe that was completely wiped out that lived in caves nearby. A single warrior from that tribe survived, and he tracked down and massacred the other tribe that did that. His methods were so brutal that he was banished from all the other tribes, and now lives as a pariah in the burnt-out remains of his village with several Smilodon pets. The players ended up befriending him, and he showed them his custom map, which allowed them to travel faster through the trails. He also agreed to help in the final fight against Kolar Kong, and seek redemption for killing such a great demon. The players never went to this location, but in the southeast, there were some caves that had a trapped clan of mermaids. They had been in the caves long before the outside had collapsed and cut them off in the primary ocean. Now they're totally stuck in there. They had a lot of treasure and would pay the players handsomely if the players helped get them out. They needed to use their ship to pull one of the large rocks out or some other method of removing it, freeing them. The twist was these people were not victims. They're actually evil mermen locked in there for their crimes. If the players begin questing them, it becomes obvious something is off. The merfolk will get more hostile and more agitated, and if they explored the rocky outcropping before tying ropes to it, they would see messages in merman that read, We entomb thee for your crimes against many. Do not let them out, for they are liars and murderers and far worse. Also, they exaggerate the treasure greatly, so it's a more modest reward if you do end up killing them or helping them. I kept the island in the middle of the island in the middle of the lake, where you can rest based on your alignment. Instead of alignment, I had it based on the player's religion, which allowed more players to bunk up together. Something interesting is, my players realized, since the fortress here was on a rocky outcropping about 15 feet up, they could fish without being attacked by some of the aquatic dinosaurs. So they started fishing a bit and sniping any of the aquatic dinosaurs that came to disturb them. They ended up eating pretty good in this adventure, and I threw out all the rules I had for survival. On to the teleporting Tyrannosaurus Rex and the Dormant King, I made it very obvious they were linked by making the T-Rex purple and the color of the water purple. While purple, he was immune to all magic, but he could turn yellow and teleport. The color changes also hint to the players that some creatures have the ability to shift their color, which sets up Kolar Kong later. Also, the T-Rex would attempt to knock players into the pool and drown them. He would grab them in his mouth and jump into the pool as well if he was not stopped. This actually was a very fun fight, with my players having to find ways to slow the T-Rex and either pull his mouth open or climb out from inside. Now for the final artifact. The players had to track down a large lizard monster that had the amulet embedded in his gut. Because it had the amulet for so long, the creature could shift between a couple colors, once again setting up Kolar Kong's abilities. This was a bit of an homage to Godzilla, so I made this creature bigger than a T-Rex and much smarter. He also has a breath attack, which acted like the spell color spray, but reduced power. After he used it once, it recharged on an 8 on an 8-sided dice. After they had all four artifacts, they could head to the ritual site, and when they did, it would open the doorway to Kolar Kong's den. If they didn't have these artifacts, they could still find the entrance, but it was protected by a magical barrier which only Kolar Kong could pass through. 
Something else we need to mention is, throughout the module, I had Kolar Kong show up and just harass the player sometimes. He would just teleport in, throw a boulder at them, and leave. Oh, one time, he showed up and smashed the bridge the players were using to cross a river, which made them have to swim ashore. He was just being an absolute menace and caused the players to really want to try and kill him. Now, if they had killed him at any point, that would have been fine, because they still had to do the rest of the adventure to get the reward. Also, in about a week, Kolar Kong would just reform and keep terrorizing people. I also added a backstory that ran through the entire adventure. Long ago, there was a powerful shaman who ruled over this island. He wanted to have a safe place for his family, so he designed all the creatures here to be extra deadly. He then had his ape companion, given sentience, and set him as the guardian over all the island and the shaman's family specifically. The ape was happy to do this, and he loved to, to be able to protect his friend's family, and thus he was given many magical abilities by the shaman. The shaman had four sons, who he had planned on leaving everything to when he died, with Kolar Kong being in charge of fairly distributing the wealth. The shaman's sons, though, grew greedy, and they slew their father to take his possessions. Kolar Kong was powerless to stop them, since he was bound to protect them by magic from the shaman. In their greed, they took their father's amulet and split it into four pieces, each son taking a part and setting off to rule their own tribe. Over the years, Kolar Kong has attempted to keep his pledge, preventing the tribes from attacking each other when possible. Then, when the players showed up and killed the cannibal tribe, Kolar Kong realized he failed to protect that branch of the family and wanted to get revenge on the players, so he started harassing them. Now, when entering Kolar Kong's lair, the players can find a room to decide. If they explore it, they will find the body of the old shaman, now Bones, as well as his journal explaining everything. I had a bunch of options written here, but I really like the idea that the shaman is honored and buried in front of Kolar Kong. This helps break his curse of unlife, and Kolar Kong will no longer return when defeated. Kolar Kong, though, through honor and the fact that the players have killed so many of his wards, will cause him to still have to fight them. Afterwards, an epic boss fight ensues. If the players have speak with animals, or use sign languages or motions, they can speak to Kolar Kong a little bit, otherwise he's not going to speak. After Kolar Kong is fully defeated, and the players release his soul to simply not kill him again, they will see a wall, clear, showing a brand new path to walk through. This path leads to a room with a crystal in the middle. The crystal has six beams of light from different color ports of the wall hitting it, all different colors. As they enter, the crystal will give them a small challenge. If you want to get through this sparkling room, make me the color of a cherry in bloom. The solution is to cover all the lights except for the red ones. The crystal will ask for several of these challenges, I actually got this puzzle from a website called Dungeon Snack, and I have it listed below. It's a great read. It has more of these challenges, and more for this puzzle specifically and tips to customize it. I highly recommend it. After going through this color puzzle, the doorway opens to the treasure room of the shaman. Inside is a lot of valuables, as well as a family portrait at the center with a plaque saying, My Most Valuable Possession. That is all for this adventure. The base module is surprisingly poor quality. I am shocked that more thought wasn't thrown into this. I would have been angry to have paid for this in 1985. This feels more like an excuse to just stat out a bunch of dinosaurs because the back here has so many on these charts. Like I like dinosaurs, but I've never heard of half of these. Also, if this video gets 5,000 likes, I will remake this module using my rules, copyright free, and put it online for everyone using the color changes ideas that I had as a baseline for it. That is all for today. Thank you for watching this far. If you enjoyed the content, I'd appreciate it if you liked and subscribed. I'm looking forward to your candor in your comments below, and have a great day. So this was a bit of a long video to make. I had another video planned, but I just got inspired to finally get to this one. I really hope this video gets all those likes because I would love to see that there's a market for this and actually be able to dedicate time to it. 
All right, you all have a great day. And oh, don't forget to join the Discord if you haven't. <laughs>